the screen. Hello, lords and ladies of the internet. I'm the King of Candor, and welcome back to today's podcast. Today we're going to be talking about King Arthur and his role in fantasy. Uh, we're still waiting for one member of this panel, but until then, I'm going to introduce you to the other members. We're going to start at the, my right with uh, Mr. Pagliaki, or Pag. How Hi. are you doing today? Pretty good. How about yourself? Excellent. Excited to talk about King Arthur. To my left, we have a fellow YouTuber, Mr. Astro, or Mr. Amazing Astro. Hello! I am Amazing Astronaut. I love comic books, and I chose the subject of today. Hello, lords and ladies of the episode internet. Because I wanted I'm to talk about King Arthur. Arthur, and because it's he is a, such a fundamental element of our culture. And you can actually see so much of King Arthur in our culture. Like, you can just see it in Star Wars, with the basic plot being a boy who discovers that he is actually a knight. And uh, superheroes such as the Justice Society of America, who have their own roundtable. Yeah, am I ever get to introduce myself? No. All right, and that's everybody important. <laughs> now, <laughs> and to my furthest left over here is our friend Pops. He has something special prepared for us today. So take it away, Pops. Yeah, anyway, so for anyone who doesn't know, uh, I go by Pops. Uh, a little bit about me. I do not have a YouTube channel, but, uh, you know, I enjoy every type of writing, media, everything, and try to get involved and learn the most that I can. So I help a bit with moderating the King server. Um, some of the, the more loyal listeners might remember me from the previous episode about food and fantasy, where I, uh, I mixed up horses with a saltwater spring, and I also compared uh, Troll's Blood to Fentanyl. So, <laughs> luckily, I've uh, I've done I've done a bit more research for this stream than I did for that one, which um, you know is a bit of a low standard, but still, I'm happy to be here and contribute the best that I can. But also, I think I uh, I've got a bit of a bit prepared here that is appropriate to introduce our subject matter here. So, fellas, hear me out. Usually, when we introduce somebody as the man, the myth. The legend. We're usually just talking about somebody that's, you know, an old high school friend or whatever. But in King Arthur, we find a figure who truly does fit all that description. I mean, this is it's the story that essentially creates the archetypal fantasy hero, provides us with a system of moral thoughts and ideals that still have kind of uh, echoes in broader and Western culture to this day, you know. And um, I'd say he's a figure who had a massive influence on real-life British politics and culture for more than a millennium after his death. And um, I would say it's a, it's a legendary story because we've got political intrigue, romance, magic, like everything you could ever want from a classic, from a fantasy story. And um, hopefully we'll be getting into all that and more. So um, I'm happy to be here and I'll help out the best that I can to try to contribute. All right. I'm looking forward Excellent to it. Excellent intro. So, yes, thank you very much, Pops. So the interesting thing about King Arthur is, as Pops said, he's a collection of different stories and myths brought together. Now, who else to talk about uh, stories better than our resident published author, Mr. Pag? How do you feel about uh, stories in general? And uh, do you have any you want to plug this time and not miss it like you did last time? <laughs> uh, well, uh, my full trilogy is uh, is out right now. Um, if, uh, if you look up the Homestead Trilogy by Lex Henderson, that's my pen name, uh, you'll be able to find him. Um, fact, if you they, don't, link to that, they don't have I'll much to do with Arthurian right legend. I'm going to be real. All right, I can do that. Would you say there's anything about the, the Arthurian myth that relates to it? Whether it's uh, no, like probably not. <laughs> or nothing. Uh, but, okay. Yeah, I I don't think I don't think it has almost anything to do with it. Uh, there's there's like no magic. It's science fiction. It's a it's a completely different genre, and the story is not like set up in any way like the other three legends. Um, Tell Star Wars that. Still say because uh, Arthur, I think because I did read I I read uh, two so far. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, one of the things about Arthur is that he kind of introduced a concept of like a duty bound hero. You know, somebody that's going to put others first and still, you know, do the right thing morally, regardless of the consequences to himself. I feel like he um, he was an exemplary of that. 
which we do see in the story, but that just goes to show that it's a cultural thing that is still ingrained of us in us to the extent that, you know, you make this story and you just think it's normal to have a hero do that without even knowing where it might have come from. And it might have come from somewhere else, so anyone can correct me if they uh, they want. Even if it came from somewhere else, the fact that the Arthurian legends have stayed with it so long proves the popularity and intensity of that. Yeah, I'm just thinking, like, as a moral system, where did we really start to see people, you know, come from that perspective and approach things from that perspective? So it usually starts around the 1100s-ish with the... Um, meeting of the Muslims in the Crusades. There were some ideas beforehand, but it really gets codified around then, which is when a lot of the Arthur legends start getting put into words and taken out of just little fragments of Welsh and English history. In fact, we should probably explain a little bit about King Arthur. So, for those of you who don't know, he is both a real and mythical figure. There was a King Arthur in history. He's not the King Arthur you know. The uh, best way you can describe this to somebody is, think about George Washington, everything you know about him, how he exists, and he's real. However, George Washington himself is probably not like you've seen in like an anime, where he has a mech suit, and he can punch things, and he's explosions. That's the how Arthur is portrayed in a lot of the fantasy stuff. He's just this larger-than-life, powerful, just destructive force who goes on and reshapes the world, even though he maybe ruled what a territory less than the most U.S. states cover. But, and I'm posting oh, Mr. Pag's book in chat definitely, right now. Definitely, but I feel like part of that... Everybody. I, but, um... Oh, yeah, thanks. Sir. So okay. to touch on what the did right there, as an example of how figures can be, um, you know, kind of so entrenched in their own myth that they can't be separated the myth from the legend. Arthur is one of those guys who he almost got hijacked by uh, British culture and British, um, you know, kind of um, propagandized almost into a figure that people wanted to um, emulate and everything. But he was, yeah. He started out as a Welsh warrior, and his name actually, Pendragon, means like head of the dragon, which dragon was a bit of a colloquialism at the time for basically like a warrior, you know, a guy who was a war chief. And so he was so respected and well-liked and propagandized because the Welsh people were rebellious to some extent to the point that, um, <laughs> you know, British kings would invade them and they'd be like, all right. And a couple more. We're going to keep rebelling because. Go ahead. Sorry, Des joined the call and it made okay. everything go wonky. Oh. <laughs> Hello, Des. Hello. Oh, man. Yo. So, this is our late comer. He's here. Make sure you bully him in the server when you see him, everybody. Hell yeah. Yeah, if you see that guy, just. Yeah. Yep. Anything. Yeah, he's super cringe. Yes. All right. <laughs> so building off what you said, Pops, Pendragon's interesting because it means the head of the dragon. Another thing that I've seen a lot about this is some people theorize that Arthur having that name means that that's what he has dominion over, which is actually related to an old Christian and, I guess, Jewish a mysticism where they talk about one of the reasons that Jesus would come back and, you know, the prophesied signs for him is he would... B bruised the head of the serpent, a.k.a. he hit the head of the dragon. That's why Lucifer is always depicted as a dragon and snake. This is tying Arthur to this more Christian mythology, even though he's not quite Christian at the time. Another thing that's really fascinating... That, go, go ahead, Pops. Absolutely. That's one of my favorite fun facts about him, about, like, so the... Technically, like, the alleged grave site that he had was at Glastonbury Abbey mm -hmm. in Britain was one of the only figures ever who became kind of like a tourist attraction. Like, people would make uh, pilgrimages to go see his grave and pay their respects while he was buried at this abbey. And he was never canonized. He was never a saint or anything. He was just this large cultural figure. But, I mean, looking back, he was introduced, at least into culture, going as far back as he was in the 5th century to about the time that the Romans were leaving the British Isles, right? And so Christianity was starting to take over, and from, from you know, the 
research that I've done over the last you know week or so, I've been doing my best because I do love this topic. But he was never actually proven to have anything to do with Christianity. But it's yeah. still a representation of how kind of a, a figure can be hijacked and propagandized to manipulate real life politics, and that's something that really interested me, at least. And the other thing is, it's not that he was not a Christian, it's just we don't know, because as Pop said, Christianity had only taken over the empire for like a few hundred years at that point. With Constantine in the 300s is really when Christianity becomes the mainstream for, for Rome. From there, right. it's it spread throughout. And Go ahead, Des, you had something you wanted to say? I, I was just going to add on. Christianity yeah. only spread for like a, a hundred years before, because... I mean, with the fall of the Roman Empire, yeah, like, uh -huh. you know, you could say it ends with uh, Orde Odevaker in, like, 476, but, I mean, Bryn had fallen out pretty early in the game just because it was a lot harder to um, supply and maintain uh, a lot of the uh, the colony, basically, just because, you know, it had the Absolutely. typical problem of everyone trying to... Hmm? I just... They'd have to reach for to keep that consistent. Yeah. yeah. It like the main problem they had was the same problem literally everyone trying to c conquer Britain would have for the next forever of we got to get over this stupid channel. Um and it's really annoying to get across that channel. So It's funny because it fell out pretty early in the game and I think 400 AD roughly. Mm -hmm. It's got... funny because Arthur may have fought against the only people who succeeded. So, if you look at when mm -hmm. Arthur may have been written and what he you know, possibly fought, he fought against the Saxons. Now, if you know anything Saxons. about English history, it's ang they're called the Anglo-Saxons. That's when the Vikings show up. The reason they're called the Anglo-Saxons is the Angles, the Utes, and the Saxons all invaded England, which shouldn't even be called England. It should be called Pr with a P, Britannia, because that's what the realm used to be. You actually can still see that if you look at Welsh, you know, because and, and, they used to be Celtic in the Cornish people as well. So they got pushed all the way back. That's why it's so ironic that King Arthur has been adopted by so many people because he started out as a what would be a Welsh hero who was fighting against the English landing, essentially. The English pushed the, Cel the Celts and the other Welsh into Wales and Cornwall. They then steal Arthur as a cultural hero, and they use him as something to call back to when the Vikings show up. They get pushed back until they actually push the Vikings back out. Then the Normans show up, take over, and they use Arthur as their legend. And that's where we get some of the first, you know, like Arthurian legends with, you know, uh, Morte Arthur and all that. These are French writing these stories. It's really funny because every time somebody conquers England, they actually say, oh, yeah, well, we actually were who uh, Arthur really likes. It's not these other people, even though he literally fought against invaders. <laughs> right, Fun yeah, fact. and it wasn't until basically the um, the Crusades that people started really manipulating his legacy and making him sound with an English legend rather than you know an enemy in the Welsh culture and everything. So it was about the Crusades because you know y you need money. So Richard the First is going on Crusades, and so you give church, you give the church money, you give him money, and. That was, again, part of having uh, him as, like, a tourist attraction or his remains at the Glastonbury. It was like, here's a way to make money. And it's never been actually confirmed that that was him, but it was absolutely ingrained into kind of their culture at the time, and it did help the, um, you know, the political <laughs> endeavors that they had with the Crusades and everything. So another fun thing, speaking of invasions, the, uh, as we have to call them here on YouTube, the no-no Germans in the 1940s, uh, one of their greatest <laughs> leaders, Harris, uh, I hate it, Goring, he, the, the weirdo who loves like, all the weird occult artifacts, he's the reason that Indiana Jones had to fight uh, the same group and watch their face get melted with the Holy Grail. He used Arthur fighting the Saxons as a justification as to why they needed to reinvade Britain because they needed to get there to reestablish contact with their Germanic relatives and finish the job of killing the Welsh. That's not something that's ever <laughs> talked about. Yeah. That's so based. Holy oh, crap. What, what the hell? I love going now. Right? 
So yeah, he uh, if Goring had his way and they'd won, we wouldn't have the long man. So there'd be no Mauler and, and no Last Jedi destruction if the no no Germans won World War Two. So uh, get on that, get on the arch of our four monitors. That would be the funniest thing in the world if we find out that like Mauler as a Welshman is closely related. He's more closely related to Arthur than like actual English nobility. Oh, Ironic. Probably. You know how many wells there are? There's like three or something. Half of them are cheap screwers, so I mean, they aren't propagating those genes. But yeah, since you, since you brought up this certain a certain political party that uh, was established in the 1930s, I wanted to mention, since it does play into kind of a segue loosely into the transition towards the, the fantasy story that we know about, the sword and the stone and how Ma, um, not Ma, Merlin <laughs> My bad. So Merlin, in that story, he makes references to things that occur in the future because he's a guy who, for some reason, is like Benjamin Button. Like, he ages backwards from the future, and he can see the future because he experienced what the future came. about the past. Uh, well, Merlin specifically is weird like that. And I think it's just in that one story, but I thought that was in a, like an interesting mechanic to have for like a magical being. That he can see the future, but he doesn't know about the past. So, like, he doesn't know enough about the past to actually change the future or give you advice about your own future. Because he just doesn't know your past self. And I was like, that's the perfect mechanic to have for a guy who's basically like a mad genius like he is in that book. You know what I mean? So I figured we ought to transition a bit into the fantasy aspect and talk about how that, <laughs> you know. Little things like that mechanics contribute to it and the thinking of it, how we make characters. I think, speaking of characters, if we're going to talk about Merlin, I think that Merlin is way more important than people give him credit for because Merlin is one of the three people who really inspired and makes Gandalf. And Gandalf is the reason we have any wizards at all in fantasy. So, yeah, if you like wizards and you like casting spells, you could think you know, Gandalf, and then you could thank uh, Merlin for that. Yeah, kind of all goes back to the original. The OG Wizred. Yep. Absolutely. Because Gandalf... Astro, I... What? Yes. Astro, one for you. So, since we know that um, Arthur kind of came from humble beginnings, didn't know who his real father was, but was still destined for great things, and yet was educated by an old um, kind of... Yeah, more or less, you know, space wizard... If we want to, if we want to talk about it like that, you think we can draw that parallel there? It's a bit of an extreme that Obi Wan would be Merlin, but I think kind of uh, the is. same. I mean, he certainly fills yeah. that role because, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I would say Luke Skywalker is like a reverse Mordred, and like imagine Darth Vader as a fallen King Arthur. No, I always thought of him as a guy who came from beginnings i always thought of luke as a parallel to arthur but reverse mordred that's reverse way more mordred, that kind of works yeah that's an that's an interesting uh that's interesting i never thought of it that's hmm yeah and because darth vader was supposed to be the chosen one and king arthur was the chosen one of his time but wow. I, 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 on and it. oddly enough both things did go wrong especially with their loves Mm -hmm. oh. Too bad we couldn't we couldn't get George Lucas to join the stream, but you know next time. But... <laughs> yeah, he's a little bit busy right now. He's writing more Jar Jar fan fictions, unfortunately. <laughs> I thought he was milking uh, on the farm. No, he doesn't. Oh, need he's to be milking on the farm. all right. Well, writing fan fictions. <laughs> yeah, he's writing Jar Jar milking fan fictions. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, you still got such soft hands, Mister oh. Lucas. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> Who here can honestly say they wouldn't milk Jar Jar? Exactly. <laughs> we stand Jar Jar in this <laughs> podcast. You got a raw deal. <laughs> mm. Or are you? Mm. Or if where you are join you, the grandma? Discord and you bad mouth Jar Jar, you will be jestered. That is a threat. So <laughs> true. I think my grandma <laughs> hated Jar Jar. Actually, now that I think about it, really kill your Jar grandma. Yes. Jar Jar subverts the like trope that there is. Like I said, we love Jar Jar here. 
No Jar Jar slander allowed. Mm-hmm. So anyway, that's so my- yeah. So if, I think it's an interesting thought that uh, he's the reverse of that. If you look at the basic ones, I think we probably should explain to some of the people here who these other characters we keep hitting at. So we briefly talked about Merlin. He's this this wizard guy who may be a demon, who may be a druid, who may be a rape baby from a demon. Every time they change his myth, his mythological backstory. But the point is, he knows things. He's got powers. He can do things beyond that of a mortal person. Uh, he mm-hmm. also then either raises or teaches or somehow is involved with a young Arthur. Not like that, like in a you know mentor role. Until Arthur gets older. At which point, once Arthur ascends to the throne, he becomes a background figure. Now, Arthur himself has like 20 different backstories. Every single person seems to just change it for how they feel. Um, one of my favorite Arthur backstories is uh, he is the son of his his father fell in love with a woman, but she married another guy, and his dad got a potion to turn himself into the girl that he loves husband so he could sleep with her while the other guy was away on crusade. And then Merlin feels guilty about participating in this uh, non-consensual fun, so he adopts Arthur because Arthur's <laughs> dad just leaves. It's just absolutely insane that that's that they wrote that. And they're like, oh yeah, this is perfect. This makes the guy a hero. <laughs> um, sometimes, I mean, uh, well, go ahead. It's also a bit different <laughs> than the one I read because I read the bit in uh, a Mort the Arthur, if that's how you pronounce it. Where Merlin actually had the idea to do that. <laughs> to disguise his king for him. Because, you know, the king wanted the girl. <laughs> so, the, so Uther, Uther Pendragon at that point was the father that wanted that girl, right? Who was married to the duke. And, like, they had their own little skirmish and everything. And then he called Merlin over and said, help me out. I just, I, I got to. You know, I got to get this nut. I have a need. I and, need to seed. That's right. And Merlin, story that I heard, at least, you know, one of them was that uh, Merlin's deal was like, okay, you know, I'll do it for you. I'll turn you into the guy and you can do your thing. You know, virgins in the chat, plug your ears. But, <laughs> but yeah, so they did all that. Merlin's deal was like, once the child is born, you got to turn him over to me and I'll figure out what to do with him from there. So it's funny because like either way he still comes from like you know humble beginnings but is still like he's destined for great things whether it's that he's raised by Merlin or he's raised by like Sir Ector and he becomes a squire of uh, you know Sir Kay the, the older brother who's like a bit of a, a you know for for better <laughs> a, a goofus in the Disney adaptation at least like, that's the one that I think a lot of people are familiar with, is that he just accidentally was like, oh, I broke my sword, get me another one. And then Arthur's like, well, there's a sword and a stone. How about that one? <laughs> he just kind of slips it out. Yeah, the acquisition of Excalibur okay, that movie, is... Go ahead. Uh, that movie was actually licensed from the Once in Future King series. Yeah, that's the one I'm Interesting. familiar with. Yep. Yeah, so that's that's the version that I'm the most familiar with. Where he starts out as a squire and like doesn't realize, but yeah, Merlin gave him over to Sir Ector because he was like a respectable knight. So it's interesting because there's a lot of different. Uh... Shoot, I just lost my train of thought. I'm sorry, boys. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I had anybody... something for it, and it was just it gone. <laughs> By the way, I do have to uh, warn like the rest the of the chat. As we start talking, uh-huh. there's a lot of um, non 21st century relationships in this story. Let's just say, <laughs> besides the uh, <laughs> the fathering of Arthur himself, <laughs> Arthur ha- may or may not have a half sister. That is uh, oh, we've heard no. about with uh, Morgan. She's Morgan Le Fay. There's a couple stories about her, and she comes up a lot later. So she's sometimes related to Arthur. And when she is, she is his, the biological daughter of Arthur's mom and the guy that Uther cu- cucked. They have a daughter, and then she ends up wanting to become a wizard to learn the same spells that were used against her father. 
She joins a, you know, a couple of fairies and even sometimes works with the Lady of the Lake. That's why she's called Morgan Le Fay, Morgan of the Fairies, because she learned fairy magic. Sometimes Merlin okay. teaches her, which is kind of interesting. But Merlin mm-hmm. usually has oh. got like druidic magic, but she's got fairy magic, which is different. I don't know how, but it is still it's described differently every time it's brought up that their magic is different, which is important. You have something you want well, to say? Well, that's one of the. That's one of the well, like the basis of dark and good magic, or black magic versus Kinda. good magic, I suppose. Well, it's different because Kinda. it's weird because her magic is fairy, which probably should be dark magic, but it's not because she's you know usually a nicest person compared to other people in the story. Versus Merlin is sometimes just straight up a demon who gets baptized, and that's how he becomes good, which. It's really, really interesting. Con- yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> they struggled a lot with Merlin. A lot of the early Christian mm-hmm. writers are like, but this guy's got, like, spells. That makes him but evil. But he's so cool. How can he be evil? <laughs> if evil, why cool? Yeah. <laughs> and it's just one of the At things that blows point. my mind, because if you read a lot of the old, like, you know, the Old Testament, plenty of people had spells in the Old Testament who weren't evil. <laughs> You don't have to make him a demon who got redeemed. I mean, Aaron goes before the Pharisees and turns his... Not the Pharisees, the uh, the Pharaoh, and turns his rod into a, sa- a snake and has it fight the other snakes. That's cool. And now you might say, oh, well, the rod did that. Maybe, but why couldn't Aaron just have cast the stick-to-snake spell? <laughs> I, don't, I, I just want to shut this religious bit down real quick. So uh, it Do really it. depends. <laughs> On what the intention of your magic spell is. Alright. So, you know, Merlin Merlin is helping a guy cheat on his wife. And at the <laughs> same time, we've got, you know, every religious figure doing their thing. You know, because at the same time, they have great faith in God. So that's where the ability comes from. And also because it's helping them defeat somebody who would go against God's teachings. So... True. If we if we could just bring it back, so Destructo, you like the Roman Empire, right? I am mildly familiar with the Roman Empire. Okay, so are you aware of um, on that like the Roman Empire uh, would recruit people from lands that they conquered to say, hey, you know, you're talented, come fight for us and everything. Yeah, they'd like Romanize a lot of. I'm aware of how they Romanized basically a lot. Okay, areas, so what do you think? Portugal and stuff. So what do you think about the idea that Arthur may have been a guy who literally was, like, conquered by Rome, was sent over to Britain, and then, like, conquered things for himself? you think that has any merit? Um, Because it, it's probably, one of those theories that he was a real guy, and, like, they base it off of that. It's, it's one of the so, theories. Probably not. Uh, it's a possibility, but the... Uh, Britain was one of the last conquered uh, areas of like the Western Roman Empire, um, and that was mainly be, be- that was mainly because um, I can't remember what emperor conquered it, but one of the emperors basically wanted glory because after Gaul, everything else was like so undeveloped. Like the reason they didn't go past the Rhine, uh, I think it's the Rhine, uh-huh. go yeah. past the Rhine for Gaul is because like it just wasn't worth it to conquer it. And that's kind of why they didn't go any farther, like, in England or, uh, like, the UK, basically. Like, they didn't conquer any more of the land there, because it's, like, it's just not worth it at that point. And the only reason they even conquered it in the first place is because one of the emperors wants some glory. So, um, it's a possibility, but, mm. eh, it's hard to say. Okay. Um... So I think that it uh, might it it could theoretically though be a legitimizing legend for like one of the Romans who uh, split off from Rome to like gain power for himself when oh you know Western Rome's going to hell because all the you know the Goths are spilling over and the Vandals are spilling over and the uh, Huns are spilling over and I'm the just gonna, and the Allens are spilling over. I'm going to just like take this and I'm going to be okay. ruler. Um, and so you can't tell me what to do because you got like bigger yeah. issues to deal with. So that, was just that a little bit. might be a thing that could be possible. Because that's, I don't know, that kind of is more about the real life guy, theoretically. Right. 
Well, you know, the, the interesting the, thing that you heard about that, Pops, because remember what I just said about Arthur fighting off the Saxons is what he probably did? That means that Arthur was a foreigner. So that's probably put in there to make all these other dynasties like the Saxons, like the Angles, like the, you know, the Normans who later conquer England and then say, oh, Arthur's our guy. They probably slipped in that he was a foreigner to justify themselves being foreigners taking over the island and then becoming the defenders of it. Hmm. That's super interesting. Yeah. It's like King Arthur used as a propaganda tool. Oh, yeah. Oh, whoa, history, a character being used for propaganda. No way. Okay, that would never okay. happen. That would never happen. That's going a little too far, buddy. That's a little <laughs> out there. That's a crazy idea. Yeah. All right. So nobody brings up a great point in chat. He says he remembers people saying that there was miracles that came from God and magic, according to Christians, are, you know, from the devil. And what he remembers, arcane magic and divine magic. It's very much like that. And that concept is why D&D &D split them into two separate groups. That's why mm. arcane and divine magic is, up until I'd say probably fifth edition, been so distinctly separated. It's not until it's not fifth edition's fault. It's really I see Pathfinder being the one who splits it off and stops with the splitting. But fifth edition broke that down with a lot of the mixed classes blending together. Otherwise, it was a big deal for arcane and divine people to be able to cast both spells. But yes, and that is related to that. But whenever you look at Morgan and um, like uh, Merlin and their magics, their spells are very much the same. The way they use them is the same. They're both helpful to certain kings and like Arthur specifically, but they're also selfish at times. That's what I'm saying. Like I understand like theoretically the split, but it's really weird that they went out of their way to say that Merlin has divine ish magic and is like redeemed, whereas Morgan doesn't get that treatment. Right. Yeah, and also, I mean, if you want to go back into certain origin stories for Arthur, so the, the right-hand man of um, Uther, his father, was a knight called Sir Ophius. And I believe he, he like, had issues with Merlin. Like, he was a Christian. He thought Merlin was a devil spawn, a devil worshiper and everything. Oh, yeah. You know, it's funny. I just realized we didn't even finish talking about the other characters. We got so caught up in, you know, tangent about uh, Arthur's family. Yeah, we get to finish. yeah, there's so much lore here. Yeah. Before we get into that, though, I do want to tell people that is something that's awesome about King Arthur's legends as a whole because he is set up as a, um, as a pseudo-historical figure. Every few hundred years, people tell stories about him, and then one guy comes out, writes an awesome book that condenses all these myths into one thing, which like super reignites the desire and pr and push for more Arthurian legends, and it's every like between four to six hundred years it seems that happens, which means that looking at you know Mort de Arthur, we're about due for another person to condense all the Arthurian stuff together into a super book, and then we have it come off from there. I've seen a couple modern attempts. Everyone seems to have either the author die before they finish. Or they, they get pulled into different tangents, and it doesn't quite go the way it's supposed to. Which is unfortunate, because a super definitive, awesome Arthurian book would be great right now. Yeah, Peg, you got that one? Uh, <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think that's going to be that's gonna be me, Chief. Oof. Uh, you got it. <laughs> Just, you know, all you're going to do is you're going to go back to the basics. Everybody was related mm -hmm. to incest in the basics, so now that's all you're doing. It's King Arthur mm -hmm. Incest Edition. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Everybody's just banging everybody. Exactly. It's yep. the only answer. Game of Thrones proves that's what the people want. They're trying to make the most <laughs> pure-blooded child possible. Exactly. Look, I just... don't know if you can. You can't get more pure-blooded than like the Egyptians. Exactly. Yeah. They're sure. trying. To, they're trying to Egypt it. Yeah. No. It's. It would be very much a letdown if they remade a King Arthur and it was just they race swapped like every character. They've done that. I mean, the whole point already. is that he's British, but yeah, they have done that. Yeah. Well, what what annoys me the most is like whenever they do it to Morgan. Like oh. we say, I was saying earlier, she's his half sister. That's to yeah. me an important part of the story because it leaves it definitely some weird, is. Well, it leaves to some weird nastiness because, as we'll get into in a minute, Arthur kind of has a crush on his sister, which is a little strange. Not gonna lie. <laughs> 
But uh, he didn't know until it was look, too late. You don't understand. He, he okay. didn't actually know it was his sister. He's completely look. Here's have you seen anime? All I'm saying is, if anime would be like, if the Japanese oh, can get away look, with it, you know, come on. I totally depend on reality. I totally look at anime to be like, yo. Exactly. <laughs> look, yeah. all I'm saying is, if that's the why whenever I walk the outside, fight, there are women with chests <laughs> bigger than my car. That's totally right. <laughs> well, yeah. All I'm yeah. saying is that the weebs can justify it, surely uh, the British can justify it. Nah, dude, if a British guy, like, you know, fucked his sister and he's like, hey, what's the problem? I watch anime. I'd be like, no, that's not valid. You're so true. We should kill weebs and we should kill the British. I like I like where we're going with this. As so, a- this about. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I do want to fo- focus down on that, though, a little bit. It's interesting because... Him being his, uh, her being his sibling, it's important for a lot of little things. That's one of the reasons that Norway gets pulled into the story, and that's how you yep. get King, ha- you know, Hakon pulled in, which is super important because Hakon's a historic figure. So he had to marry somebody. It's really weird that they picked her of all the people to get married. And oh my God, nobody, nobody says so old true. myths are anime, so but better true. prove me wrong. <laughs> so <laughs> true. <laughs> I can't prove you're wrong. This is true. (laughs) So true. Okay, well then, where does anime get their their culture and their morals from? Is it from old... Or is it from up Japanese? Germany. (laughs) (laughs) Germany. All of it. They actually imported in boats. Why do you think think all the anime sims for uh, the bad guys in World War II? (laughs) Hey, they never apologize. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I know they don't apologize. Do you see them apologize when they say, wow, I really like the Germans of World War II? They're like, no, we like the Germans of World War II. Yeah, we, we think they're great still. I mean, you guys won the war, but you didn't win I don't our think hearts. you guys understand. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so for anyone who doesn't Peg is a, a guy who, who needs to be thanked for his service. He won the hearts and minds of our people. Oh, oh yeah? I didn't, I didn't realize that. Yes. I don't know. This is the first time that I'm hearing this. Wow. Exactly. You're the best number one man. So I do want to point out something. You don't understand how hard the Japanese simp for the no-no Germans. Uh, the no-no Germans, you know, you might think, oh, they're the worst people in World War II. There was a guy, John Rab, Rabe, R-A-B-E, who was the official uh, German soldier stationed in China to assist with uh, the Chinese, showing them how weapons work. He saw what the Japanese were doing. This no, no, man. He, he fully into it, loves Hitler, got a signed tattoo of him and everything. Saw what the <laughs> Japanese were doing to the Chinese and said, yo, guys, you're being too cruel. And at yeah, night, he would drive up. around from the, uh, he'd leave the embassy, drive around town with a bat, and beat up Japanese people abusing Chinese people. <laughs> That's what he would do on his off time. <laughs> He's like, look, look, the Chinese aren't good, but they're not, you know, they're not the Jays. Come on, let's be a little, like, at least they're yeah, I was he said that they're they're treating the Chinese so horribly that I, a no no man, must step in and stop this. I mean, like, they were what, they were like doing like baby beheading contests. Yes, they, like, they were. were. They were like dementedly were. awful, like like yeah. twisted horror movie level awful. Look, shit. the best Man thing that is the happened... worst thing that's ever happened right. in human history. <laughs> it might well, legitimately be the like... the, the, the best I... thing to ever happen to Imperial Japan was the no no Germans taking all of the flack for like the like ten years before and ten years or after that real. Uh, real quick. for that like. You know, no one t- pays attention to any other country within like mm-hmm. a twenty-year span of them. I uh, All right, all right. So everyone else just gets like a major pass. Mm-hmm. But real quick, to give you a reality check, I um I actually anticipated that a certain YouTuber may have actually been on this stream, and I was gonna talk about how King Arthur literally re- related uh, not at all to Godzilla, and so I was hoping <laughs> Japan wouldn't. When I saw that he wasn't here and might not come up at all, and uh, now we here we are miles miles off topic. Yeah, oh, we are miles off topic, bro. We are not miles. We are planets off topic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we are. He's like, and on to the second character, Morgan Le Fay. So, anyways, the Japanese during World War Two. <laughs> so, if we want to show the Japanese King Arthur, since I have this ready, 
There you all go. There you go, uh, chat. You have this ready? I have. I pulled her up. There's the Japanese version of her. Is okay. he jacked? Is he jacked like Korean Jesus? No, no I suspect no. not. This is this is a uh, King Arthur from that uh, Fate game that you guys wanted me to share. Hell yes, yeah, Fatal. Oh, it's from that one weeb game that uh, what's it called? Yeah, that Gotcha game. Yeah, that one. Yep, there you go. It's the one with the Stolfo. Don't act like don't, we don't talk about us stuff. Don't act like Astro. Astro, Astro, Astro you are very close. You are very close. You are on thin ice yes. up for that Alpha <laughs> <Stop> right. reference. <laughs> so All right, guys. So let's get back on it. So let's get through the characters. So Morgan, yeah. It's a, hey, don't worry. It's only here briefly. It's gone now. We can put it behind ourselves. We're done with talking about Japan. So, Morgan Le Fay is his half sister that he may have banged, and that made his his son slash nephew Mordred. Mordred is really important to the Arthurian legend because Arthur doesn't have any kids. Maybe he sometimes has kids. He sometimes doesn't. But if he has kids, they don't matter because Mordred is Arthur's successor. Mordred is his son slash nephew, and what happens is Arthur has a night of passion with his sister Morgan, and he gets born. Sometimes. If they want to remove the cyst the uh, incest aspect, Morgan is actually just happily married to her husband, the king, or they sometimes just make her not related to Arthur. But either way, Mordred is born, and he is of the same blood as Arthur somehow, either through siblings or birth. Therefore, he has a claim on Arthur's throne. Usually, when Arthur leaves to go on a quest, excuse me, it's when Mordred goes after the throne. Oftentimes, depending on the myth, Arthur and Morgan will have this epic final fight where they get into a huge war with each other, and Arthur is fatally and they kill wounded. Each other. Well, yeah, usually Arthur is either fatally wounded and kills Mordred, or is wounded to the point where he gets on the magical boat called the Pridwin and sails off to Albion to come back once he's healed, which is interesting Christ like imagery, again, from the King Arthur mythos. There's a couple of the characters I talked about that we have to probably hit on. Arthur's wife, right, Guinevere. Go ahead. I was going to say, because Arthur's supposed to like come back at like the end times or something. Yep, from he's supposed to come back and save Britain from the worst times ever. It, yes. yes. Which is why that Winston was... Churchill is definitely King Arthur. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, it was Margaret Thatcher. There we go. The, the, the most beloved <laughs> English person. <ever. laughs> No, that was the, the, another thing I wanted to mention real quick, because like there's not really any, any um, you know, iteration of the legend that i know of where they're not technically related but the one i was familiar with was that morgana was actually the daughter of arthur's mother but at the same time had a different father yep. that that was the guy that udred cucked or that you know it, i forget duke his cornwall. Name. Yeah, cornwall the duke of cornwall yeah that's that's the guy the duke of cornwall's her dad that's why they're only half siblings which makes it half okay from what the internet told me well, it's, oh. okay. it's well, it's weird still. Like, Again, it's one of those things where this has been a disaster for the internet. Really has, but no, like it's one of those things where, if you look at it from a holistic perspective, it's really interesting that they decided to, that as a story, that's what they would include. And this is also one of the only stories I know of that includes both incest and shows how it leads to a terrible outcome. Almost always, whenever these medieval people have accidental incest or like purposeful incest like this, it tends to be weirdly okay. That's almost always because that's how they justify it. Like, you know, with, you know, the Habsburgs later on and the Egyptians in ancient mm -hmm. history, that it, it's weirdly okay in their minds to do this. But this story says because that was done, the act was so sinful, it corrupted Mordred and made him evil from the beginning. Now, because the story's got to talk about Arthur's wife, Guinevere, she's beautiful and she's awesome and she kicks you know ass in her own right, but she does nothing essentially outside of that. She kind of likes Arthur. She loves Arthur more than he loves her. Yeah, He's very fierce. Yeah. Somebody say my name. Uh, yes. You're, you were cutting out. Well, I'm yeah, sorry. you seem fine now, but you were cutting yeah, out. Yeah, you're fine now. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> like. Like oh. You were yeah, you were losing oh, a little and there bit. He cuts out again. Yeah, <laughs> they're cutting out like my dad going to get milk. Fortunately, you see me coming back. Maybe I'll all describe right. Guinevere 
uh, let's see, I think Arthur uh, had an affair with Lancelot. That's probably the most famous thing of her, in all honesty, because she... You jumped the gun there, Astro. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, I know. We have to talk about Guinevere a little bit, who she is. She's another local... Yeah, we're She's descended from another local noble, and Arthur marrying her helps in like solidify his claim to the throne. It's a marriage of, mm -hmm. of alliance and a marriage of convenience. They care about each other, but she loves him way more than he loves her. His heart is still set on Morgan. His desires are still with other women, and this makes her feel less than beloved. This doesn't mean right, Arthur... Yeah, he's got the... Um, the... Go ahead. He's got, he's he's got like. I was going to say I'm just agreeing with you because it, later on in the story you do see the evidence that she, um, unfortunately, does her thing. But yeah, it's like he marries her because of the political strategy and everything, which is absolutely realistic, whether it's historically or you know in a story or whatever. But she also uh, takes takes a bit of a fancy to some other characters that are also iconic. I think of course, I fixed with it. the famous case with uh, Lancelot. Well, yes, and Lancelot. Both. Yeah, and so what's important about the reason she does that is it's often portrayed that Arthur is not giving her the attention she deserves. That's important because right. it's interesting that Arthur is such a failed and flawed man. Usually in a lot of these old myths, the hero is only accidentally flawed. But he, he has a very much, I hearken back to the Greek heroes of old, who are purposefully mm. flawed. They have specific issues going for them. They have other, you know, f reasons that they have, yes, failures. That is something you have to ap ap uh, appreciate about polytheistic is that, like, yeah, sometimes the gods, they do have human traits. Which I thought was kind of a funny thing that it was notorious. So Zeus was notorious for kind of transforming and tricking women into getting with him. And here we see the same thing with Arthur's father, with his uh, tricking her into thinking that he looks like his uh, her her husband, the Duke. Exactly. So you know you here and there. Yeah, just a little bit here and there. Just a little bit here. Yeah. So, yeah. this is important because if you look at Guinevere, she wasn't getting the love she deserved, so that's why she starts having a fanciful relationship with Lancelot. It starts out first that her that she's just giving him eyes, and she likes the fact that he reads her poetry, <laughs> and he's just nice, and, you know, we're just talking, Arthur. He does my hair for me. It's okay that he's in the bath with me. Things like that until it gets to the point where Arthur realizes, hang on, she's cheating on me. Which is ironic because he's cheating on her with his half sister. So he, at <laughs> one, some point, has Lancelot, who we will get into later, executed for his crimes. What this does is this makes Guinevere kind of hate Arthur. And that's important because when Arthur leaves to go on his quests, yes, Lancelot is a fan fiction. We'll get to him in a bit. When, when, when um, Arthur goes on his quests, he finds out that his son slash nephew Mordred, the evil one, in some stories starts banging Guinevere and romancing her to legitimize his own claim on the throne, therefore stealing the alliances Arthur had, which is super interesting and super like extra screwed up. Now Okay, and that's also something that we that we have to take into account for like you know inspiring kind of real life fantasy stories because you, you know sometimes you want to be a little more realistic in the human aspect that it's like oh, yeah people will certain regardless of like you know the magic that's available or the fantasy creatures or whatever like humans will be humans you know the, you got incest in fucking game of thrones everything oh yeah and i think game of thrones is most inspired by this compared to a lot of the other fantasy stuff in the modern day, which is interesting. Uh, Game of Thrones is basically a uh, ripoff of the War of the Roses, which is really interesting. Really? Oh, yes. yeah. It goes I don't know too much that. about the War of the Roses, but it... So it turns out G.R.R. Martin had to plagiarize to get his books out, eh? <laughs> so that was... Well, it's a good thing to do that. I think it's a really good thing to take a historical event and then be inspired by it. 
because I'll tell you right now, sure, the War of the Roses was definitely inspired by it, but there are no zombies in the War of the Roses. There's no ice demons. There's no dragons. There's no swarthy Spanish slash North African dudes in the South. Dorn doesn't exist. There's no foreign invasion like that. None of that. Well, the kind of That's what they, they want you to think. That's what if they you let want me you to think. Quick. So the War of the Roses, so that was how Henry the Seventh, right? The first Tudor king became king That's of England. That's how the first yes. Tudor king becomes king yeah. of England. So, like at the uh, very end of the Hundred Years' um, War, if I remember yeah, correctly. Something I might have mentioned earlier. So Henry the Eighth was not the the successor. He was the second son, and his uh, successor initially was supposed to be his son, who he literally named Arthur to try and like use that to claim legitimacy because... King Arthur was such a popular character that he said, well, if I name my heir Arthur, everyone's going to support me and like it. And the but, one uh, the second Arthurian age. Unfortunately, he, um, he died at 15 and Henry VIII, you know, old boy, we got him. And he actually ended up changing. So there was um, the round table that's still hanging up in Winchester. Henry VIII took that and he repainted it because it was from about the turn of the 14th century, like the late, like 1300s or whatever, like that, that like modern day round table that we see now, if you're to go to England and go to Winchester and see it, it's hanging up on the wall and it's a big round table. And Henry VIII actually took that and said, well, you know what, we're going to repaint that to have the giant rose in the center because that's a Tudor symbol. And then we're going to have a big portrait and we're going to call it in, um, what's his name? We're going to call that Arthur's portrait. And uh, it had a suspicious resemblance to Henry VIII himself, which just mm, goes to show how much of an impact he had on kind of popular culture to say, like, you know, if you like Arthur, you're going to like us because we're, uh, you know, <laughs> we're trying to emulate him. But the Tudors were very Arthurian in the way that they approached things, their policies politically and everything. Yes, they were. And I think that, again, people keep tying back to it. Now, I want to answer a chat that we got from AJB Productions. He said, yeah. Lancelot was a fan fiction. So this is <laughs> one of the most interesting things in history because it's both true and false. So the original stuff, Lancelot did not exist. That is true. He never was in any of the old myths, the old legends. However, Lancelot gets added in by... Eleanor of Aquitaine's daughter, I believe, because she really? commissions a she commissions a work that stars Lancelot. I think it was that one I mentioned before the call started. Lancelot in the cart, where he's just sitting in the cart like an absolute goober. This is <laughs> yeah, this is important because I Eleanor had one of her I don't remember if it was a daughter or her sister was married to a Hungarian king named Laszlo. And this was supposed to be a tale of Laszlo going around and doing heroic things. It turned into Lancelot because the French don't know how to say words correctly. And <laughs> it's true. And that's allegedly where we get the, get him from. And that's why he got added to the Arthurian legend. It was a partial legitimization of this visiting King Laszlo to, their, to the French throne to kind of say, hey, look, we have a, a guy just like you in our myths and... Look how cool he is. Help us kill the English, please. And Yeah, that's... It is similar, absolutely, the fact that you're using a figure who, you know, doesn't necessarily even come from your own lineage to be like, you know, people have fans of this guy, so I'm going to say I like this guy and I associate with him. But and, at the same time, you know, Lancelot, I learned about him from uh, Shrek 3. Uh -huh. yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding, I read the book. Super interesting. Sure yeah, no, it's it, it, right. We have these these characters, these like historical figures mixed in with people that actually existed versus people that are so famous that they become legend and then you can't tell the difference and you're like, Well, did he actually slay a dragon or <laughs> you know, did he do what? Like because you have them in the same stories of people that are real. But it's like you got to appreciate that, that someone is so iconic that they have you that. Know. Oh, if that we are not. Well, on the subject It, it is that. really interesting to, like, when myths include, like, real people. And on a completely different note, 
I have to go. So I'll see you guys later. All right. Goodbye. Uh, have a great, <laughs> have a great day, man. All right. So as he leaves, on the interesting thing about Lancelot, he is part of a larger trend, which is the I call the "Who cares about Arthur" trend in the King Arthur mythos. There gets a point <laughs> where everybody starts writing stories because oh, King Arthur's so cool, but they stop caring about Arthur. They start writing like all the side pieces get stories. Like Lancelot actually has more written about him than Arthur does, even though Arthur's the, the main character. You know, is that true? Yes, it's like Breaking Bad. The spinoff, Better Call Saul, has more seasons than Breaking Bad does. Yeah, fair enough, dude. There are people that will argue that Better Call Saul is better. Astro, so since you wanted to say that Luke was not quite a parallel to King Arthur, given the humble beginnings trope and everything, do you have anything to say about um, a certain woman in the Star Wars series? Leia. Oh, no. <laughs> That, was that a... was, I, I uh, actually meant Ray Skywalker, but go ahead. Oh, okay, because my, my head went to a different place. Well, I was thinking of put just, you know. Away, be... Put your dick away, Walter. We're talking on stream. Because I personally, I personally thought that Luke and Kung Arthur were kind of uh, parallels. And then, you know, they remake them with the Ray and everything. And I'm like, all right, well, maybe that's kind of similar, although she came from a different origin. I you know, no spoilers. Ray I don't want to spoil. Ray was what born into on a desert planet, abandoned by her parents. She didn't have any destiny lineage until it was retconned until in like the last movie. Oh, if it was retconned, then my bad. Oh, okay. Ray retconned like four different things for her. She was a she yeah. was a Kenobi, a Skywalker, a Palpatine, a nobody, a Palpatine, and then we settled on Palpatine's <laughs> granddaughter. We settled on Palpatine. <laughs> All right, all right. It was stupid. But had they had any sort of inkling of idea, then yes. I still think that, though, you know, Jedi Knights in general, people who are blessed with that level of power, no Spider-Man, they, um, they still have to follow a certain code that's influenced by something that Arthur brought up with, uh, you know, the round table and everything. Uh, chivalry? Chivalry, basically, yeah. I want to answer Caleb's point here. Yes, Arthur is still the main character, even if he has less stuff, because everybody is basically Arthur's orbiters. They're all around him, and they deal with him, and it's related to him. Which oh, is... yeah. Well, that, that's how kingship works, man. As the king, you do influence everything. But uh, I think that a lot of the people from the round table, the knights, are interesting. There's a story I don't have... It pulled up early right now. I'm sorry that I mentioned earlier where somebody went through and named all 1,000 members of the Knights of the Round Table, which that's got to be a big freaking table if you have that many. All right. Yeah. Real quick, though. Does anybody know who the fattest knight at the Round Table was? No. Sir uh, was the fattest. Circumference. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> got that's got to get. I love it. <laughs> I've been waiting this whole stream to make that joke, bro. Nice. <laughs> you waited to the perfect time. Love it. Well, I, I forced it, but yeah. No, it's, I think it's the perfect time because I was just about to move into talking about the Knights of the Round Table because there is yep. a lot of them. Uh, Let's go. All right. So this is being pulled from Wikipedia. And uh, that way, if anybody says, oh, well, there's a knight here that I know that it's not on here, I'm sorry. I'm just reading off the Wikipedia article. There's a lot of them, and I don't really want to go through everybody. Uh, so first one is Acalon, or Sir Acalon of Gaul. He is introduced in Le Mort de Arthur. He, he uh -huh. is somebody that Morgan has a crush on. It's her first boyfriend, and then he gets killed by Arthur in a duel. That's the entirety Damn. of his backstory. Damn. That's it? That's pretty no, much for... it. There's, there's other stuff that goes on, like uh, so she, uh, he is one of the reasons that a lot of people say Morgan hates Arthur and is the inspiration for a lot of those, those stories where Arthur is portrayed by her. Cause there's some times when they say she oh. poisons him before the battle with, with, uh, Mordred because even cause Mordred is her son. So she wants to put him on the throne and she poisons Arthur because Arthur killed, you know, Acalon, which is just. 
everybody's just banging everybody in this. You can tell they're written by French people. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, <laughs> another one is uh, Agovalde. His entire note is that he is King Pelinor's eldest son. We'll get to King Pel. Actually, do you want to talk about King Pelinor real quick? I know we mentioned him before the uh, the show. I know you like to talk about him, Pops. Briefly, yes. I just want to say real quick, since you brought it up, do you think there's anywhere of a parallel between the twelve disciples and the Round Table? Definitely. Oh. I think that that symbology and that idea <laughs> is there. Arthur himself, the entirety of his legend, is very much a Christ-like origins. They constantly talk about him as if he's Christ, and they, he even come, is prophesied to come back, which is fascinating considering the details of how much he sucks and how much he constantly fails, which is such a weird thing. But they definitely wanted to, to relate him to Christ in some ways. And I fully believe that the Knights of the Round Table are that. That's why everybody has this idea that there are 12 knights of the round table, even though that number's never actually listed. Right. It's just considered that. However, I think usually it's 100 is what I see in like a lot of the myths. There's 100 people, and there's like 24 at the Catholic each time. Which, again, that's a big yeah. freaking table. That's a yeah. huge table. Absolutely. And I mean, that still plays into the idea that, like, um, that, that Pelinor was a black knight out in the that was out in the woods that was in uh, you know a, a disgraced nobleman and the first thing you learn when Arthur meets up with the knight who got beat up by him is like you know there's some random black knight in the woods and it's like well why didn't you take care of him and the guy was a new recruit he didn't know any better so they were obviously recruiting people you know to help out with their force and everything and um, I could grab my notebook I think I've got his name somewhere but he was a new recruit but Pelinor was the guy who was the Black Knight, and I believe part of the lore in one of the stories that I read, at least, because, you know, obviously, there's a million and one different versions of this story. Yes. <laughs> but, so, um, this is a Black Knight in the woods who decides he's a landless nobleman. He's annoyed. He says, screw it, I'm just going to start killing people in the woods, which, you know, is probably the most relatable character in the entire story. <laughs> But, but um, you know, he insults Arthur at one point. He says, you know, because he does beat him at first. He, like, you know, not, he breaks his sword and he's like, listen, you look like the type of man to run away at the first sign of injury, which I thought was hilarious because in Monty Python, when we have the, uh, the night in the woods, he gets his arms chopped off and he's like, it ain't nothing. You know, you, it's a flesh wound. You know, come back here and fight me. <laughs> I still need to watch Monty Python and the and the Holy Grail. Yeah, really? so, should, man. Oh, it's such a great nope. film. When I first heard that, I was like, that anecdote of somebody who literally gets their arm chopped off and then criticizes someone else for being like, you know, you're annoyed because you got a slice on your hand. You're a bitch. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you know what? That lines up exactly with like tis but a flesh wound. It really do. <laughs> and, boy, and I know you boys wanted to bring that up because that is obviously a classic cultural influential oh, thing. Definitely, a hundred percent of this story. But yeah, I mean that just goes to show the the level of like different genres that were influenced by a story like this. It's like you know we wouldn't have modern without it. Yeah. So I think I do want to hit a couple more of these nights because they're funny as heck to me. So the next yeah. one is is knight uh, either Adra or Agravain. So Agravain, he's the second Agravain. son. Yeah, he's the second son of King Lot and Mor uh, Morgus, who's Morgan when she's married to the king of Orkney, not to the king of Sweden. So this is Arthur's nephew, but not also his son in the in this version of the story. So he's half brothers to Mordred. It's funny because Agravain also tries to kill his other brothers. Several times because they're like all competing to eventually get the throne. And I think it's in the Vulgate cycle is the work that goes about that. And he's also one of the knights who helps Percival in Percival and the story of the Grail, which we'll cover when we get to Percival. He's super important. But he's one of the knights who kind of helps Percival a little bit and kind of goes against him. He's he's there essentially as one of the people. 
And he's also in my favorite Arthurian legend, Gawain the Green Knight. He shows up and is noted as being very quarrelsome and trying to fight with everybody, which makes sense. His name is Angry Vane, so, like, of course he is. I love unsaleity in fiction. Fiction needs to be more direct, no more subtext. War on subtext. Great. Did I talk about uh, Ago Valley? Uh, no. no. Yeah, he's I'm... the son of Pelinor, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who specifically? I thought Percival was his son. Uh, he has several sons. Ago Valley um, is Pelinor's eldest son, so he's Percival's older brother. Got you. Okay. Yeah. Oh, this, here's another great one King Baggy Magus. <laughs> Just... Is he Irish? <laughs> no, he's probably Welsh. Ugh. Let's see. He is the father of the knight Malignant. Oh, Malignant's a name for another one of the knights. That's pretty cool. That's a name? I thought that was a title. The Knight Malignant. It just meant like the bad guy. Yeah. He's both a title and a, a character. That's pretty neat. So yeah, he appears in um, a lot of the early stuff. And Bagdimandius is one of the knights who tries to uh, help out with the abduction of Guinevere once she gets kidnapped originally and taken to Mordred's court. But he kind of falls out of favor for a lot of it because he shows up there. He helps Lancelot when Lancelot wants to uh, get with Guinevere because he's like, yeah, hey, I'll look the other way, bro. But he just fades uh -huh. away. Now, that tells me... If you're looking to write some Arthurian legends, King Bagdamagius here, there's your guy. He's got a goofy name, sure, but you could take him and easily spin him off into his own character or write an Arthurian note about him. Remember, all the knights of the round table did something awesome to be promoted here. So if you want, this guy has nothing for him. You know, we're not going to go with all of the things, there's hundreds of them. But I just wanted to hit a couple of the guys at the top, like in alphabetical order, just to show you how. There's still gaps in this legend, even though it's thousands of years old. But we are going to probably hit some of the most um, important guys here. I don't want to mention Percival earlier. Do you want to talk about Percival, Pops? I don't know too much about Percival myself beyond that. Um, part of the lore was that he literally was so son of Sel uh, not Sel Pelinor, right? Yep. And that he was, you know, in some stories mentioned literally to have been like blessed by God. So, like, this was a guy who was basically blessed and, like, understood, you know, do the right thing, become a knight. He's destined from a young child to become something greater. And that's really the extent of my knowledge about him. I don't know too so, much about him. Percival is super important for, um, like, the meta aspects of King Arthur's stories. So what Percival does is everybody wants to give quests to their knights to show how cool they are for their their OCs. Don't do not steal. Percival is one of them. He got given like a you know, we talked about earlier the these quests where his dad sent him on some stuff. His dad gets sick, I believe. So per, or Arthur gets sick. So Percival goes out on a quest to find the Holy Grail to help save Arthur. That's where he goes on oh. this awesome epic thing where he meets the fish king and he you know deals with the giants and all this stuff. That quest right there to I'm going to go on the Holy Grail basically gets adapted by all of the knights at some point. Every one of the knights decides they're going to go on a quest for the Holy Grail because Percival did. Even though I think Percival failed because nobody found the Holy Grail. It depends on which versions you're going for, of course. Now, do you think that's more based on like old school like Greek myths about like Orpheus and Perseus, or do you think it had more of an influence on later works? Uh, no, I think he influenced later works way more because there is a... Oh, I'm going to feel stupid for I forget the name. There's an Irish slash Celtic myth of a magical cauldron. And it's like Kerna... It's not Kernabog. It's something like that. I know Kernabog is a demon. But um, it's, a, it's a myth about him going after this basically totally not the Holy Grail thing that is in other mythology. And then because... English and medieval writers didn't know a lot about mythology from earlier Irish things. They translated that as holy cauldron, and they said, oh, this means ho the holy grail. This is Christ's holy grail. So we're just going to call it that. 
So it goes from this wealth brew of immortality, and they add that to the Holy Grail, which is actually how the Holy Grail gets the idea of immortality added to it. Hmm. I still think it probably plays a role in like the influence of kind of making him King Arthur being making him from like you know a pagan figure to like something that you know religious people in you know not modern england but england people in medieval times england people that that care where his gravesite is and everything by kind of translating that into a christian perspective definitely makes them care about him more and see him as an influential figure definitely and i think again if person wasn't written as a side story i would see it much more as a legitimation of arthur I really do think Percival, because he was written in the 1100s as, you know, a secondary character, I think this somebody really liked Celtic mythology and wrote him going out and doing stuff for the Celto-Irish myths. Because he kind of, like the Fish King's another one, he shows up in his spear battle and he goes to the king's palace, it's underwater that you have to sing to get out of. He has a lot of very weird specific myths that are from the Celto, you know, the, 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 that part of the world. And, yeah. you know, uh, he goes to Ireland specifically. That feels to me like somebody took the Arthur mythos and said, but I want an Irish version, so I'm going to make up Percival, and he gets to go hang out with all the Irish guys. And then, as Percival was popular, because it was well-written and people liked it, he got pulled back into the Arthurian legend, and then it didn't make sense that if he goes out on this quest to find this holy goblet to heal Arthur, that nobody else would go out. So all the other knights had to now go out and go after this artifact. This is something that, you know, if you see a lot of modern uh, media critics like Baller complain about, that there's no reactivity in other stories. This is a great example of that reactivity. If one knight goes out because Arthur is sick, it's stupid that all the other knights don't go out. It makes Lancelot look like a dick that instead of going out to try to save Arthur, he's trying to bang Guinevere. So now Lancelot... Marvel, whether it be Phase 4 or 5, you know, you have these entire civilizations of people... And you meet them in Phase 4, and it's like, why didn't they fight the Infinity War? Like, where were they the whole time? And it, it makes a lot more sense to somebody, you know, within the continuity of your own universe. And, you know, this is advice for people who want to get involved in that sort of thing. You do have to pay attention. Thing happens that affects people on a large scale. Yeah, absolutely. Some civilization that you're just introducing later on is going to have to give a shit about it. Oh, uh, I don't know if that's Arthurian specifically, but yeah, kind of. Uh, well, I think that it is showing <laughs> that you can build back no, up. Bro. You know, this is a collaborative storytelling thing. And it shows that other people can write something, and you can go back and fix it up. Granted, Marvel does stupid stuff, like you said, introduce whole civilizations, but they uh, they didn't have to do that. Other people could totally come out and react to stuff. Sure. Sometimes they just erase the civilizations from people people's minds to excuse to excuse that about why they weren't weren't known before. It's just lazy storytelling. Like, you know, look at this. You could just talk. There's so many better reasons. They had cloaking up. They, you know, they had some sort of curse put upon them. They thought that they could hide past Thanos. Whatever you want to do, there's ways to do it. Anyway, since, you know, we're going to end in about, you know, 45 minutes. So I don't forget. I want to talk about Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. I think the Green Knight what? is my favorite Arthurian legend. Of yes. all the little oh, stories. Oh, is that the J? Uh, is that the Tolkien one? Yes, it is the Tolkien one. Glad that you figured that out already. Ah, knew it. Yeah, and uh, Tolkien is one of the, the main reasons that we have this in modern English so well. He, just like Beowulf, translated this to us from Old English into a very good and presentable version. I do thoroughly enjoy Tolkien's version of the Green Knight. But just even from a perspective, Gwen is just this dude who shows up through like, all the Arthurian legends. He's frequently mentioned as being there. But he feels almost like a, hey, I need it to list a couple of knights who are hanging out here. Oh, I better use <laughs> Gawain. He really feels like that. He's like an also character. Kind of like, if we want to tie it back to the Marvel, how Wasp is. She's always just there, and she doesn't really do a whole lot except off screen, which is they named the Avengers. What would you call something? Wasp didn't name the Let's Avengers see. in Modern Marvel. 
Because, like, as a guy... Did... Sorry, I'm not sure about the comics. Nobody reads the comics, Astro. I offered to do a comic <sighs> podcast with you, but you wanted to be <laughs> King Arthur instead. Because you didn't, you have never well, read yeah, anything Neil next. Gaiman's talked about. I, I have read a few issues of Sandman. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> um, what what parallels we might have for somebody who serves that same dynamic in like a modern day story, or even like a modern day telling of an old ass story? Second, but. Oh, Astro, I'm trying to give you a fucking segue here. Yes. Talking. So what would you say is a character? <laughs> Pag. <gonna> kill you. <laughs> All right, yeah, so... I think so the character ignore who... Astro. Pops, don't give him any bones. Screw Astro. We're going back to, to the Green Knight. <laughs> All right, Green so... Knight. Yeah, Gwen always is right, there. Right. Huh? Do you going to say something, Pag? Okay, I was so Gwyn's all right. So Gwyn's always there. He's hanging out, doing stuff, and he's part of the round table. And he's also maybe King Arthur's nephew, but like I don't know. If it's not Morgan. It's his his mom. He just sometimes called Arthur's nephew. Eh? All right. Sometimes yeah. he Morgan is his mom. Sometimes Mordred is his brother. It's his half brother. It's weird. There's a lot of timey wimey BS that goes on in the Arthurian legend where certain people age faster than they should and age down. Yeah, unfortunately, Ant Man and the Wasp, you know, nobody does care about that film. It's unfortunate, Caleb. But um Unfortunately that that ties into the fact that the Arthurian legend and the myth and everything plays into so many different stories. It's like it, like what I'm used to is like that's his like half son, right? Yeah. That's what I'm used to. So I'm used to him seeing as as like a bitter deadbeat dad rather than actual somebody who, you know, wants to be king after he dies or anything. I'm like, it's strange that there's so many different influences that, you know, can be applied technically. Oh, yeah. It's super interesting. You know, again, the way basically how you feel about Mordred tells you how you feel about Arthur and the rest of the story. If Mordred's a bad guy, then Mordred is uh, thrown, you know, Arthur's got to be a good guy by default. So anyway, oh yeah, the Cauldron Rebirth, Astro did find it. Para de So, oh, I'm just checking out council text, finally. <laughs> Our little yes, chat here. I just posted a meme in there. Share it. <sighs> Share it across the world. So, while I get this meme set up, like I was saying with the Green Knight, I think the Green Knight is a awesome or an awesome myth. The way it's set up and the way it talks about is such a fun story in terms of getting um, across some of the way that fairies work and some of the like just the weird BS that they pull. It's awesome for that. Here's the meme that Astro posted. If, I'll leave it on the screen if you guys want to read it while we talk. Let's do that. So, the round table, uh, the, 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 the Green Knight shows up. The, the story is the, there's a Green Knight who shows up to the castle, and he is this hulking powerhouse of a man, and he is clearly going to be the like a, just a beast to fight, and he demands satisfaction. He demands that these great knights, all these powerful warriors, fight. Unfortunately, most of the awesome knights like Lancelot and all them, they're literally just too busy right now, or they're too scared. I like them being too busy. Otherwise, if they're too scared, it kind of ruins their characters a bit. But that's all right. So they're scared, and they're they're they don't want to deal with what's going on with this Green Knight dude. But uh, while he's there, um, Sir Gawain's like, you know, I think I can handle you, you know, big boy. So what's the challenge? Yeah. And he says, all right, look, you get my axe. This axe is the coolest axe ever. You get, to, you know, it will just kill people immediately, and it, you know, it, it gives you like, you know, eternal life and all the other crap you can promise with it. However, the axe, you know, you know, to earn it, you have to, you know, kill me. You get one swing. I will not defend myself, but know uh -huh. that the, whatever swing that you do to me, I will do to you in a year hence. Now, Gwen is a little bit slow, if you ask me. Because the first thing he thinks is, oh, well, if I kill this guy immediately, then there won't need to be a second swing. So Gwen lines up and, and asks, are you sure? And he's like, yeah. So he swings the axe and completely cleanly cuts the head off the Green Knight. 
The head lops to the ground, and Gwen cheers excited, like, hell yeah, we did it, boys. And then the Green Knight picks up his head, puts it back on, cracks his neck. Good hit, buddy. I'll see you in a year. So Gwen's now, like, you know, freaking out because he's like, oh, crap. I've got, you know, a year to live, essentially. Shut up, Astro. Did uh, he you know, get the axe? Uh, he did. He, 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 he didn't get the axe yet. He has to wait for it to come back. Ah, the Green Knight's got to come back and hit him in the neck with it now to justify it. So Gawain's trying to, he's training, and part of him is like, maybe I should run away, and you know, that pushes the Green Knight, says, I'm not going to come back to your house here. You need to honor, you know, the challenge by coming to my house, the Green Chapel. And the whole time yeah. he's upset about it, then he talks to Queen Guinevere, and she's like, look, man, if you end up dying, we will make sure that we bury you with full honors, because what you did was, you know, honorable, at the very least. She's like, all right, fine. So Gwen, who's not even like done anything powerful, goes off and, go- and goes after it. And now there's a whole bunch of awesome and weird stuff that happened during the time. I don't want to spoil the rest of the story. He meets a fox who can talk, and he gets a sash, and he, you know, all this craziness. But he gets to the Green Chapel. When he gets in there, he finds the Green Knight sharpening his axe, and the Green Knight says, "All right, buddy, are you ready?" And Gwen says, "Yeah." And the Green Knight says, okay, uh, would you please present your neck the way I presented mine? And this is Gwen's last chance. Every aspect of his being is telling him, dude, isn't expecting it. You could stab him in the kidney and run out of here and you get the axe for free. But he swallows it and says, no, I'm. it's the right thing to do. If I must die, I must die. He sits there. The, the, the knight winds up this huge swing. And before he says, well, before we do it, I'm going to test it. Fells a tree in one swoop. Looks back. You ready, boy? He says, yep. Swings right. the axe and stops, simply touching Gawain's neck. He says, you know, my arm was kind of tired from that first swing. I couldn't muster oh. as much strength as you did. Why don't you take the axe? And he hands it over to him as a, you know, for fulfilling his promise. You know what that's about? That's like, you ever seen, um, and I got another point to make after this. You ever seen the clip from uh, Blades of Thunder? Where he literally like slices the guy's like <laughs> hair with oh, his yeah. with his little like ice skiing blades and everything. Yeah, slice the dude's head off. Right. Yeah. So I'm talking about that's literally exemplary of the idea of like a knight. So like a knight at the time had chivalric duty, right? And so his whole ideal is He's going to be a guy who's willing to take the risks, whether it's like potential consequences to himself or whatever. And it's, um, I know everybody, um, kind of is, uh, done over and done with Tiger, Tiger Wakiki's, you know, Thor's or whatever the guy's name is. (laughs) But there's a great quote in there where he literally goes, he's like, I'm doing it because that's what heroes do. And I was like, you know what? That's a good quote. It's like literally like that's the extension of the moral code that we're trying to go for here. Like he's doing it because of a a code that is ingrained in him and he believes in it and he's committed to it. And it's the right thing. And just think about that, like how scary of a situation that is. You could have ran. You could have kept your honor and lived. In fact, you could have just not shown up. You didn't have to accept it. Even after you got smacked in the head, you know, or before you you got smacked in the head when you hit the guy. There's so many situations and ways you could have just left and been fine. And Gwen still had the fortitude to get there. And he had to fight to get there. It wasn't an easy walk there. He had to go through a whole bunch of trials and blizzards and monsters just to go to a spot to die. Everything was pushing him back from that. Think about the heroics and the power, powerful nature that is. That you said, I know I have to go die. I f- failed the first time to kill this guy so as a return i must die and this is solely for the sake of honor and he goes there and he gets rewarded with the you know second most powerful weapon behind excalibur what a cool just story and you know the themes and the myths there i love it and that's why i'm so frustrated that the green knight movie was so bad god fuck that movie it was, movie. Movie. It was done by a24 oh it was done by a24 i believe it was. <laughs> We're not going to talk about the casting. Besides that, frustrating me. <laughs> Everybody in that movie was just so strange in the way they acted. It was just not. It was so ethereal and 
oh man, this is mystical and these aspects may or may not be real and oh, what the ending is open to interpretation and wow, Gawain realizes he can kill Arthur and he can become the king. It's like, what the hell is this crap? Because they basically combined Gawain and Mordred in that film wow. in a weird way and Gawain's just kind of just gonna say a bitch in the movie. Like he hates and he's so mad that he has to do all these things and he completely changes the the ending. He doesn't he doesn't present his neck to the to the Green Knight like he does. He goes around and scams it. And he like goes out and like trips him and tries to like, dude, what the hell are you doing? That's ruining the entire myth. Gwen needs right. to yeah. essentially be ready to there's, die. When when there's like a, you know, a story like that where there has to be a specific like moral and action that applies to that moral that's going to be displayed. If, if you don't show that in your own little adaptation, it's going to fucking, it's going to ruin the entire idea of this story originally as it was, because it, it, yeah, like the whole point is like, I'm a guy who's willing to sacrifice myself for what I believe in, whether, you know, the reason is stupid or not. And you hear you have a guy who's like being dishonorable. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to lie. I'm going to trick someone. It just doesn't hit the same. Yeah, it's like they, they decided to make an adaptation, but they just kind of stripped out the, the heart of the story. And Yeah, it's it's it. literally like, oh, here, I'm going to use somebody's name because it's a popular name. Mm -hmm. And then, and then you know, I'm going to, you know, just ruin the entire moral of the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just not a good good ad adaptation. I don't know. I haven't watched the movie. It's so whatever. purposely subversive, and the idea is just trying to get you to think. Because a lot of, not all of them, but a lot of A twenty four films, like The Lighthouse, it's specifically set up in a way that's confusing to try to get you to think. Which I understand why you do that, but I find that style of storytelling moronic. I want you to tell me a good <laughs> story. I really. <laughs> Just you put a bunch of themes okay, and okay. symbology in front of me, and you tell me that you don't have a plan for it because you want me to interpret it. That is like brain dead storytelling. You should have things that you have going for the story. You should know what the story you want to tell is, and if you want to leave subtle background clues to the real story, and I can pick that up from from viewing it, that's cool. But when you tell me, oh, yes, the story can be interpreted by anybody, and as long as you have a correct understanding of, the st of what we have on screen, any, any and all results are correct. No! That's you being pretentious and not wanting to tell a story. Oh, look at the pretty pictures. <laughs> it's purposeful that the seagull looks like garbage. Astro, you got any thoughts? He's pooping right now. <laughs> He's pooping. He's pooping. So... Another thing I want to talk about, though, related to this story, because I love the story so much. This story may or may not be taken from Fred Brickrain, which I know I butchered that. It's an old Irish story about my favorite Irish hero, Cú Cullen, called Cú Cullhane. I love him. He's such wow, a... Wow, not Ken Baru? Uh, nah, Ken Baru's great, but Cú Cullen's my number one boy. I'm sorry. It's all right. Go ahead. I just I'll, well, one day we'll do a whole podcast on Ku Colin. I just tease fantastic, and it's just more people need to adapt him anyway. So there's a story of uh, Flint Brickin where the uh, I think its name is King B Barry Crew. I don't know if he's a king, but basically he's like a nobleman who's known as a bit of a dick. He pranks people and he likes to cause trouble and he does things where like he promises both girls he's going to marry them and he doesn't like that's the type of guy he is so he hosts a nice. feast and invites the three greatest heroes on the land Ku Collins one of them and then uh, Connell Cernach and Leroge Burodak and I know that's because Connell is like Ku Collins kind of buddy and rival and then Leroge is just a meme character essentially he, sh he shows up and he gets shit on by the story constantly, but like, whatever. So they do all these tasks, like check, climb a mountain, you know, milk, milk 50 goats, all these things to prove who's the best. The very last one is there is this, this giant that they have to cut the head off of. And everybody goes up and they cut the head, they cut the head off, and the giant says, hey, the only rule is if you cut my head off, I get to cut yours off in return. Nice. And he's gonna, he said, I'll come back tomorrow night for it. So... He, everybody does it, and each one of them cuts his head off successfully, and he says, all right, I'll be back tomorrow. So Ku Colin and these other guys are sitting there like, what are we going to do? 
Larry Gay just runs out of the hall because he's like, you know, I'm not waiting around. You guys are morons. Honors for cowards. Okay. Kukala. You want to get. You want you want to just explain us real quick why multiple people could cut off the same head. So every time he cut it off, he simply reattached it and said they didn't hit it right to the next guy. Because what it was is basically <laughs> they waited in line at the top of the mountain. He said, "All right, you guys stand outside the door, come in one at a time, and try to cut my head off." And of course, Kukulin got pushed to the back of the line. You know when that, when that happened? So they go in there, they cut the head off. They leave like hell yeah, I did it. And he walk, and the giant will walk on his head back on. Like, no, 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 you failed. I'll see you tomorrow. You better hope one of your other two buddies can do it. And each time it was yeah. just a prank, bro. And that at the end of it, it turns out that uh, everybody else had fled because you know, except for Kukul, and he's like. If I gotta die, I'm gonna die here. I may as well die like a warrior, and maybe I can at least, you know, take this guy on at the end. As Kukon's waiting to just fight this giant to the death, he walks in and he claps his hands. Like, oh, good for you. You're the only one brave enough. He takes off his disguise, right. and it turns out it's the King of Ireland. <laughs> the King of Ireland is so happy that Kukulin is the only person brave enough that he gives Kukulin land and declares him the champion of all Ireland. Uh huh. <laughs> so, so was that? Yeah. So it very clearly has the same mythos and the ideas that um, Gawain and the Green Knight has, except it's much mm -hmm. less mystical. Because think about it for a second: if the king was wearing the costume the whole time, that means it was a costume. These idiots got fooled by a guy in a suit wearing, you know, a fake head. <laughs> so <laughs> funny to me. Maybe it was just in there. Do you know what year that's from or whatever? Because I got to look that up because I remember learning about the Giants Causeway, about the Giants that fought that were from England and from Scotland. And that was super interesting. Myth. But I, I've never heard this one before. Yeah, uh, Flay Brickham, it's from the... Gosh, let's see if I can Google it. Uh, have it in the 8th century for sure because that's when Ku Colin was. So 700s, which... Hey, guys, that's close to what Arthur's around is all I'm saying. Arthur, Beowulf, Kukulin. Yeah, fellas, you want to live? I'm sensing the medieval Avengers could uh, could totally, or the Dark Age Avengers. There's your title, Dark Age don't, Avengers. Don't do it. Man, I'm just saying. Merlin shows get... up and is like, I'm making a team. Exactly. He's going to do it. He's going to have he's gonna have Beowulf, King Arthur, and Brian Beru all team up. This is going to be embarrassing. Dude, it's it's like the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, except you won't make a terrible movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be awesome, I promise. But yeah, so I that's I just really like, yeah. No. I'm telling you, 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 it's one of those things where stealing the like and combining um, mythologies like this is an untapped market. I've only ever seen it done once. Well, not once, once, but one time. It's when people could buy King Arthur and Sinbad, which interesting combination. But like, that's it. That's the only. That's the limit of your exploration. You pick the one Arabic story that you know, and like, oh, yeah, that's all we need here. We got our white boy and one Arab, and we're done. Really? There's so many cool mythological warriors and heroes. Just. In, Ch in Japan at the time, this is when we have probably one of the greatest warriors to ever live, Benkei, who fought and, def and we know he's real. This dude was a towering, powerful man who fought so ferociously <laughs> on a bridge that he killed like 300 dudes defending one bridge. So the enemy's like, all right, well, f fuck, what are we going to do now? And like, what if we just lined up and all shot him with arrows? Because he said he's not going to leave the bridge under any circumstance. So for like an hour, they shot him full of arrows, and he still stood there taking them and ready to shout, and, come on, bring it. And he just sat there like, okay, what are we going to do? They ran out of arrows, and they're sitting there like, he's just standing on the bridge. After four more hours, they eventually go over to see what happened, and Benke died standing up because he flexed his muscles so hard that when the arrows hit uh, him, oh, yeah. it kept him standing. That's how powerful <laughs> of a warrior is. I'm like, dude, what an awesome myth. Or his gravity yeah, resistance. Yeah, but just like you have characters like that around the same time period, why wouldn't you have just some globe trotting guys getting together doing awesome quests? You could just make a secondary character like you know Jim the American shows up, and now he's got to go throughout the different continents dealing with these people. It's free real estate. 
it's tough because at the same time it depends on like you know based on the world building like what territory does your guy want to actually take over like there's no reason for a guy who was a roman and was invading britain to give a shit about japan you know that's the thing if you, you want to have to that, like, be a conqueror get... but there be... has to be some sort of reason why he would care to reach that far well you, i'm saying you could write another character who shows up and meets these people and quests with them. And maybe the, if you have people who like, you get Ku Cullen, you get Beowulf and you get Arthur and they have to go to Scotland and kill some dragon or something. There's plenty of stories that you can tell with people locally related. That would be kind of neat. And you could just tell another thing is something I, again, I don't know why more people don't do it. You don't have to tell a novel. You could do what, you know, a bunch of hey. short stories that are all about these people. And each short story, you know, maybe three or four chapters is written about this character in your mythological interpretation of history. Mm. Yeah. You think it's more important to have like a narrative that you can fit into a story rather than like trying to make an entire thing into like, a, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages into a novel? Um. I don't think you need a narrative. I think that's... If you're writing a novel, yes, you do. But if you have a short story, you don't need an overarching narrative for the whole novel. Oh, okay, gotcha. You know, gotcha. You, Conan's really? best works are just that. Comic books are just that. The best parts of Skyrim and Fallout is reading the small lore entries. All they are are small short stories. Every quest that you play in a video game that is a small little short story, most part. There's some big ones. But it's a short story. The, clearly short stories are beloved There's, they're awesome and you should go to them more writing a collection of short stories about your thing would be fantastic that's one of the things that makes uh, you know, a lot of modern mythology I think fall flat is we're stuck following one dude the whole time or like a group of characters and mm -hmm. it never feels right like that's one of the things with Game of Thrones that's the real reason Game of Thrones is never going to end it is too complicated what? to pull itself together because Martin is stuck no, that's, in a situation. Too complicated. Well, Martin's stuck in a situation where he has to either tell his characters to stop acting in character, get their shit together, and move to the to places so he can end his story, or he needs to keep writing them in a way that's true to their character, which ruins his story. Because unfortunately for him, he didn't set up enough small details that would force these characters together in a way that's exciting that he wants to keep writing. You don't have to do right. that though. You could just have stories of people in this setting dealing with mythological events. There's a, I know what the first book is called the, the, the first of the moon it's sitting over there. There is a, is the Malzaban, I think. There's a fantasy story that the the authors tried for a decade to do that. I don't know if they stuck the landing or not. But they tried to make novels essentially do what I did, which each novel is building towards an event. You don't got to do that. People mm -hmm. don't want world-altering events. They don't need big stories. If every single story is a few chapters that's character-driven, you could totally sell it like hotcakes. That's what I'm going to do when I get to write my fantasy stuff because that market is just dead. Nobody's touching it. Nobody's going into it. Mm -hmm. Because you're stuck with, I want to write a short story and... If you want to do a short story, you kind of want to immediately publish it because that's the benefit of a short story. But nobody's doing collections of short stories except Harlequin Romance, which that is the number one topic on Amazon Books. Romance novels and just stuff like that. There's a market for this here. It's just people don't know it because they kind of shied away from it. Well, yeah, no, there's absolutely a market for, you know, hypothetically, there's a market for something that, you know, kind of doesn't exist, but also, you know, deep down people want it. Well, it's, it's uh, Peg, you got any... Yeah. Are, you, uh, are you talking about, like, actual romance novels, as when you, when you say that? And do you are you talking about writing romance novels? No, no, what I'm saying no. is short <laughs> stories, like this length of those crappy romance novels, tell me mm -hmm. that if those short novels sell like hotcakes... That tells me that people do want short stories. It's just for so, they don't want a long epic fantasy for short stories. The, the problem is the problem is kid. Problem is, uh, people buy like and this the, is for uh, the writers out there. Any writers? The, the novel like world is mostly romance novels. Like any any format is mostly romance novels. Um, and 
I would suspect that the reason that is, it's not that there's a hunger for short stories. It's that there's a hunger for pornography and people who are consuming <laughs> pornography don't care if they're reading a 90,000 word novel of pornography. They just want their porn. So uh, I would agree with you, except look at all the great sci-fi and fantasy novels and zines that we used to have. Look at Clark. Clark didn't write many big that's books. True. Look, you know, look at uh, you know Asimov. There's all these short stories. They used to exist. They disappeared mm -hmm. for some reason. Why? I don't know. It's because of Death Magazine. Maybe, maybe that is yeah. why. But we have the modern age. I don't, you know, and you could write collections of short stories now. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Instead of publishing, one up, go ahead. You could set up a like a blog or something like that to do out your short stories, or I think that they might they might be all like drop boxes or something like that, a letterbox maybe. Where you, you do drop like uh, short stories, um, and, then, and you can right. probably even like, I don't know. I think I think that there's uh, digital magazines that are going that you could look up. Um, I'm sure I've seen. I think there's one called Man's World that's advertising for stories. I don't write in short story format, so I don't pay attention to these. But if you'd like me to, I can I can send you these when I see them. Sure. Okay, but, but how I'm... does that uh, how does that relate to King Arthur? Well, because of, that's, that's the question. best parts of King Arthur. It's a, he is a collection. <laughs> I'm serious. The King Arthur is a collection of short stories. That's Absolutely. all they are. And, that, and if yeah. you wanted to write a, you know, short stories like the Arthurian legends, just do that. Just pick a couple nights, write a short story for each night, and then sell that as a compendium. That's the real answer here. Each chapter or two is a different thing. The most important fantasy novel ever written is probably The Hobbit because it changed the fantasy game and got fantasy to be published again by people. As much as there are better novels, I think Lord of the Rings is better than The Hobbit specifically. The Hobbit oh, sold yeah, so yeah, well. But like, well yeah, but yeah. well, The Hobbit sold so well, it reinvigorated sci-fi and fantasy. People had thrown that stuff out and were trying to get rid of it in the, the 1920s and 30s because they're like, oh, we're done with this and it's just put in a nerd corner and nobody wants it. <laughs> the Hobbit sold well enough that it pulled everything back forward, which allowed everybody to get republished again, which is just baffling to me. But The Hobbit is a collection of short stories, essentially. That's all it is. It's short stories that of Bilbo and the dwarves getting into shenanigans as they stumble towards Mount Doom. All Tolkien did is he wrote all the short stories, then he said, not to Mount Doom, to... to Smog. We need to get to, to Smog to the Lonely Mountain. So after he wrote all the short stories, he put them in an order, and then he added in an overarching thing. Like, oh, and, you know, at the beginning of this day, we're th we're thirty miles from here. We're a few days from here. He added that in afterwards, and then published it. You could totally do that. These collections yeah, of short you, stories. Um, oh, it's totally a lost art form. But are you calling them dwarves? You racist. They're called hobbits. <laughs> There's, there's both. There's dwarves and hobbits. There's dwarves yeah, and yeah. I think but you hobbits still just legally. throw them all into one, you know. Well, it's just dwarves, actually. The, you Bilbo you can't just pull in. every five foot. <laughs> well, Bilbo traveled with the dwarves and the hobbit. There's nobody else. Gandalf shows up like three times randomly, but he kind of like shows up and says, oh, have you succeeded yet? No? Okay. I'm going to go back and fight a, a, you know, a necromancer here. Have fun, kids. Gandalf <laughs> doing his thing, like that's, yeah, that's so. again, like that's another thing. If you are going to have something that serves as a prequel or a children's version of whatever you're writing, you do have to pay attention to the world building, like how Gandalf was kind of occupied. Again, it, that plays into the fact that later on he played a different type of role. Exactly. In fact, the Lord of the Rings wasn't even conceptualized when The Hobbit was written. The idea that to that um, Bilbo had a rap battle with Smeagol in the you know <laughs> over the riddles, and then he got the ring. That was a completely different magic ring originally. It was just a ring of invisibility. That's why it got retconned in by Tolkien himself into Satan's ring. You know the powerful object that's going to kill everybody. Originally, it was just a ring of invisibility. That's all it was. And he actually mm. went back and rewrote part of the Hobbit after the Lord of the Rings came out. To add that in, you know what? That's an interesting thing. Cause, because what what um what like magical items we have in King Arthur that will influence you the same way? What is there? I think there's any evil artifacts like that. I know they got right? the the, the, the yeah. tablet. Or they got the axe of the Green Knight. We got Excalibur or the fifty other names for it. 
Lancelot has two sheaths. One is a dagger that lets you, if you draw, you get cloaked in shadow. One is a thing that will heal you if your sword is plunged into it. Uh, what are the magical artifacts are there in King Arthur? Do you guys know any other ones? The best one I can think of is King Arthur, and the biggest fun fact I can learn about it is that Excalibur was not the one that was the sword and the stone. That was the sword of Britain. Excalibur yes. was the one that he received from the lady in the lake later on in the story. Yes. Which, yes, um, which is something that they mess up a lot in popular culture. Modern media and everything, it's always just, you know, you think, you know, number one, King Arthur. Number two, Excalibur. But at the same time, you're not respecting the original lore. Duh, we almost forgot. Okay, so here's the lists. So, I just said Excalibur's King Arthur sword. Badass. Then you have Caliburn, which is the sword that sometimes is also King Arthur's sword. Sometimes that's the one pulled from the stone, depending on the myth. So that's the sword of England. Then you got Claret, which is the sword of peace. It's known as the Coward's Blade. This sword has some magical powers that um, sometimes force people to just bend their will to you automatically. And it's just stolen by really? Mordred, and he uses it against people. That's how he gets an army to fight King Arthur. You're kidding, really? Nope. And then you have Camwayan. Cam uh -huh. Somebody call Mahler so he can pronounce these words for me. Get him no, on the podcast. Just, he shows up. He, he needs another podcast. He's done with Stargrift anyway. <laughs> yeah. Let, let me get, get that ginger show. on. Exactly. So, yeah, you get got Cardawanian, and that it means little white hilt. It has some special uses, such as it cuts a witch straight in half, which pretty cool. Not going to lie. It's a sacred and blessed weapon, but that's it. They, it doesn't do anything other than we know it's, like, super powerful, and it cuts people in half when it gets hit, which... Granted, that's really cool. Uh, of course, we can't not mention the Prydwen. That's King Arthur's shield that could turn into a boat. And yes, that is why Arthur Maxim in Fallout 4 flies to Prydwen. And that's another Arthurian legend tying back in. Just constantly going down and that's down. That's one thing. Because I wanted to bring up, because like even like the um, kind of the ideological standard behind the ways that you were going to use these like, you know, blessed weapons or holy weapons or special weapons or whatever. It kind of comes down to the fact that like, you know, do you have faith in some such ideology? Because otherwise you're not going to deserve this weapon. And I thought, you know, it, it kind of takes traction with the fact that Christianity was gaining traction. But also just faith in general and being respectable as like a devout follower of a given ideology is still important. It's an important thing that like um, kind of people follow to this day. Uh, oh, another mythological thing. Uh, Excalibur scabbard is actually better than Excalibur because if you have the scabbard and oh, you yeah. stabbed, your blood stays inside Healed. you, which is really cool. <laughs> I know it's used as healing. I think it's much cooler that um, it's as Merlin describes it. When thy scabbard is is with ye, you shall never lose any blood, even if you are sorely wounded. Always keep it with you. What a cool thing! They can cut your arm off, and you can just reattach it when you have the scabbard. Guys, that's another piece of free real estate you can play with. Like, come on. That was one of the. There's so much real estate in King Arthur tales, but people only know the surface level stuff. That's right. One of the one of the um like the little charms like as he was receiving Excalibur from the Lady of the Lake, I think it was almost like a parallel to the um the goddess Artemis, the goddess of the hunt from Greek mythology. That was like you know you will never die in battle. You'll die. You know you might get old. You might get sick. This and that. Oh wait, no, she was. You will only die in battle. Never mind. She said you were only immortal. She did but, the reverse. Um, <laughs> the same principle applies in the opposite direction, and I'm sorry I brought that up. I, uh, it's right. hard to put it into words. You're good. Um, another cool thing is Arthur's Spear. Uh, Rano Guy Miniad. I'm going I'm to put this here, and I want one of you all to try to pronounce that for me and tell me what you, how you I got think you. that is. I hate the well sometimes. Uh, let's see. Rano Oh, You got it. You got all it. Right. Cool. 
So it's the slaying spear, which is really cool title. Love it. But again, it just like cuts people oh. in half. Neat, but that's that's not even the only spear, by the way. Uh <laughs> I got here's a here's one thing. So um you know how, you know, the most iconic weapons used by King Arthur and the British Army back in the day and everything was the sword, right? Yeah. So Technically, the most effective weapon that humans, you know, pre-ballistic um, weapons could have used was the sword, right? Or, no, not the sword, the spear. So the spear was more useful than the sword on a large scale as far as, like, most people went. But having a sword was a sign of nobility because you need to have a sword. You need to, like, pay someone to forge it, which takes a number of months. You need to pay someone to train you in swordsmanship and everything and like having a sword and knowing how to use it was kind of a sign of nobility and a sign of like you know i i have the resources and the time to know my uh to know my skills and you know adhere to them and everything so having a sword was kind of a sign of a higher status than just a spear which was seen as like a savage thing hmm. it's a peasant's weapon so let's That's go through right. some more of these Real awesome no, go ahead, sorry, Pops. No, I was just saying, like, effective as it was, a spear was still, like, uh, culturally looked at as inferior to a sword because it was kind of like a lower status. Yes, yes. Because anybody can use a spear, not everybody can use a sword. So another cool one is the sword uh, Galafine. It was given by, by Arthur to some of his knights, depending on the myth, it depends which knight. Uh, this sword is an ever shining light, and when you pull it out, it lights itself on fire. Which that's just awesome. I love having flaming swords. Another one is the lance of Longinus, which is the spear that was used to stab Jesus to see if he was bleeding. And other than it having healing powers uh -oh. and blood constantly dripping from it, destiny. yes, the spear of destiny. It's just cool that like Arthur wanted to get that. Like that's really neat. Mm -hmm. Are you I mean, if it was up, you want to talk about? Go ahead. No, I said you said. Oh, what did you want to say? I uh, I wanted to mention real quick. I think the myth behind it, right? Real quick to give context is that he's so you know our boy. He's up on the cross, right? Sir. And then a Roman soldier stabs him, and he goes, "Well, where's all the blood? This is just waters. Truly, this man was, a, you know, a divine being. There's no blood. He's all water." Yep. That is. It's hard to put into words. I only saw like you know a little video of it when I was in fifth grade, but you know, that's all right. It's a very cool myth, and it's part of the reasons that Jesus' divinity is proven. Uh, another cool one yeah. is the mantle of Arthur. It's a cloak of invisibility, which is just neat. It's a cloak you put over yourself. So Harry Potter got their cloak of invisibility here from oh. Arthur. <laughs> We're going to get into Harry Potter. Yeah, that's going to be another one. Don't worry, boom, sure. everybody. Harry Potter was originally <laughs> supposed to be this week's podcast. <laughs> that's right. Until we, realized, until we realized that we were following up on Easter, right? Exactly. And so Easter represents the the coming of our savior and the the welsh for a minute because of uh the book called the history of the kings of britain which still left a little bit of uh, open space there to say well arthur maybe he didn't get killed at the isle of avalon or whatever it was he didn't get killed by and mortred so, he fled to the isle of avalon that's right and so back. there's still that underlying belief or at least there was at the time which is why um Henry the second or Edward this Edward the second had Edward so much II, trouble yeah. with the Edward the second makes more sense. He had so much trouble with them because they truly believed, you know, we had Arthur in Wales. Maybe he's going to come back someday. And so they refused to submit to the English kingdom and say, well, we're going to rebel because, you know, someday our king will recognize that what we're doing is right. And he'll come back and everything. And so I thought, you know, oh, the second coming, that's a Jesus parallel. Look at that. How about that? Yeah. Uh, face. So another uh, one of Arthur's famous artifacts is the hamper of Garanthir. Mm. 
you basically it's a super powerful basket. You put food in for one guy and it spits out a hundred versions of that thing. So you can feed hundreds of people effectively. Which that's just really good when you're trying to conquer stuff. And then yeah. related to that is the horn of Bran. It's a never ending cup that provides wine and water for everybody. Which he must have been great at parties. This is another uh, funny Probably. thing. To... Go ahead. Would you write that down? Would you say that's like more of an ability that someone can learn, or it's more of an uh, just one person can do it? So, in my fantasy setting, if anybody can learn that, that completely changes logistics and it ruins things. D and D is forever ruined right. by adding in the spell create food and water. Just that right there completely changes everything. There should never be a hungry person ever in D and D, especially because it's a level zero spell you can just spam out. Moronic. Yeah, pretty much like any old any old grandpa could learn that. Like it, it would, I mean, you don't you need what like ten intelligence to learn that. So like you don't even need almost, that. Just go buy a wand of it for fifty gold. Yeah, that's yeah, too much for your average peasant. Gold. But like, <laughs> just Do just being that. a peasant, like everybody. Sh I'm pretty sure that like almost anybody can get into the uh, the like uh, what's it the NPC classes. There's yeah. there's one that gives them like zero level spells right off the bat. Yeah, and not just it's that. Rough. Go talk to the why aren't the clerics just having buffet lines of free food? They have to train people. Yeah. So shouldn't clerical training be summon a hundred pieces of food today? Mm -hmm. oh, anyway. <laughs> so another cool one is the halter of Aponia. It's given by the goddess Aponia, which okay, and it's if it's hung on a bedpost, it'll allow you to summon a horse that you desire the next morning, which First. is pretty neat. <laughs> Aponia. Yep. Aponina. I don't know how to say the name. The next one is a ring D that D is. You are you sure it's not? Speak the name for you. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. You said Aponia, and I was like, the word pony. The word pony <laughs> is. The name. Yeah, I know, but look at that. How else you say it? There's the word. Apona? Apona? Um, yeah, go ahead. Epona. Epona. Exactly. Ape. So yeah, then there's just all these other awesome gifts, like uh, the Lancelot is given the Ring of Dispel, which allows him to dispel enchantments and remove mind control from people. Percival got it originally, but P Lancelot just steals everything from him because that's Lancelot. Uh, the Shield of Joseph of Arimathea. So he is the guy who, after Christ died, took Christ's body down. And with uh, Nicodemus, they prepared Christ's body in the ritual ways and put it in a tomb. And the shield, allegedly, is uh, made from him as he has, because he, you know, was a cup that he used to collect the rest of Christ's blood. Sometimes that's what the Holy Grail is. Sometimes the Holy Grail is mm. the goblet that Christ drank of after his at the, the Last Supper. It kind of depends on who you're talking to about that one. So Right. Yeah. Do we know um do we know if uh the quest for the Holy Grail is that an explicitly like Arthurian story or is that just something that kind of gets traced back very far and you know to the extent that it Affects Indiana Jones to this day and everything. Because so I, I always call it was Arthurian personally, and I'll explain why. The Holy Grail has uh -huh. been a thing in Christianity forever. However, it was a thing that didn't get popular until the Crusades, which is right before the Arthurian legends get rewritten. What happened is was about the... the. Go ahead. Yep. I was about to say, because right when the Crusades were getting big, was about the time that, you know, quote-unquote, Arthur's remains were getting dug up at Glastonbury by Richard II. And, um, you know, he's going on his Crusades, and he's saying, you know, Arthur believed in this, and these people fought Arthur and everything. Exactly. So we never... Those things, you just can't know for sure, but it's super interesting, because at the same time, it does have an effect on, like, global politics... Policy, religion, even. I mean, the Vatican followed him because, you know, saying, for better. Yeah. 
you know, for King Arthur himself, the original myths did not have him going after the Holy Grail. But that got added in. But also right. the, the thing to remember is nobody cared about the Holy Grail beforehand. It wasn't like other people talked about it. Arthur didn't. No, nobody cared about it. Then as the crusade started and people started getting fervor for them, that's when Arthur got the Holy Grail added. And I, that's why that myth I mentioned earlier that uh, Asher posted the name of over here, uh, the Per de Hani, the, 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 the big cauldron, that cauldron, which was already a, an Arthurian legend that they went to get, that got turned into the Holy Grail. And then it got turned into all the knights are questing for the Holy Grail. And it got turned into our guys need to go to the Holy Land to kill the Muslims to get the Holy Grail back. Right. That's the craziest thing. It's because would you call that kind of the the origin of like fantastical like fantasy stories? Or kind of uh, Oh gosh though. No. There are w- uh, Beowulf is way older than that, and that Beowulf has fantastical <laughs> origins too. <laughs> Here we go with the fucking Beowulf, bro. Well, no, and I would say the Troy is even older than that. Beowulf Troy, is important. Well, I would say you, there's a reason that whenever we talk about uh, the Western culture, it goes back to the Iliad and the Odyssey every time because those were noted as mythological and fantastical stories, yeah. even at the time that people knew they were because they they opened with in the Age of Heroes, which means both in the past when people had magic or in a time when magic was around, which is completely different to the, our current time. So that's what I would point to yeah. sure for that. All right. So when you're going to have... Go ahead. I was going to say, if you're going to have, like, Greek characters who are, like, demigods, that's an entirely different system of beliefs with the, the gods and everything. Oh, yeah. That's where it gets complicated, trying to juggle everything. Uh, well, it gets complicated yeah. until oh, good. you get into like some crazy uh, Christian mythology. If you at- take the Nephilim as uh, fallen angels, as in like <laughs> partial demons, then you could totally have them be uh, be there. You know what? I'll tell you. Tell you, chat one next next week. Remind me to talk about Moloch. There's a funny story about him in the Bible and how uh, related to the whole. Oh, to boy. The, uh... oh, boy, oh, boy. oh well, there is related to the uh, the Ark of the Covenant. It's a very funny story. Yes, I stole it from Wendigoon. Uh, I doubt any of you have seen this episode of these, of uh, Weird Bible that he's on, but it's all right. So with that, everybody, it's about time. Before we go, I am going to announce that we're doing a new show. In a Let's few go. weeks from now, we're going to be doing a live stream on a book that we're going to read. We've talked about several different of the Arthurian legends here, and later today, there's going to be a poll opened up in my cha- in my server, Ooh. and I'm going to post another one here on YouTube. Of which join the server. Yes, join the server. Of which Arthurian legend are we going to read? And then, as a class, we're going to read them through them together. And then, in three to four weeks, depending on scheduling, we will have a book club podcast where, for the allotted time, we will talk about the book, talk about our thoughts on it, talk about how it influenced other things, maybe go into some theories and some, some stuff about it. That way, you can get a full experience. We will not only be doing this for Arthurian books, we're just going to start with an Arthurian book. From here, the goal is to start covering some of the more important but lesser known pieces of fantasy and sci fi. I promise you right now, you're going to have to read Arthur C. Clarke at some point, guys. It's He's too important to not read if you want to talk about you know, our hobby. It's good for you. Do it. Yes. We're not going to be reading difficult things, though, like Blood Meridian. I promise. <laughs> up. I was going to say, yeah, we're not reading any Wendigoonian books. Exactly. There you go. We might read Paradise Lost, though. That might be fun to watch everybody miss it. That's a good oh, one. Yeah. That Honestly, yeah. I'll give you that. I'd be happy with that. Yes. So with that, I would like to give everybody a chance to uh, say any closing lines. Pops, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. Uh, basically, I'm happy to be here. Astro, I wish you talked more. You're the I'm guy. Sorry, man. You, you, were the you never today. talk on podcasts, man. I'm but shy. anyway, give you any BS. It's whatever. Um, so basically, um, I'm happy to help out with uh, you know the research that I've done. Anyone that wants to uh, submit a writing thing to me, I'll critique it. Basically, I'll just tell you that your grammar is bad. Peg knows this as well as anyone. So true. Okay. Fix your grammar, please. Peg. And uh, yeah, join the king's server. He's the guy, man. He's join he's literally server. him. 
He's him, bro. <laughs> Thank you. Mm-hmm. So, Astro, would you like to tell the uh, channel what's going on on your channel? I know you've got some new content. Uh, you just put an Alexa review. Yep, that was a fun little fast review because I have a goal of releasing a video a month. Uh, so my next video will be about... Podcast. Go ahead. Oh, yes, yes, I invaded it. It, it, it reminded me. Yes, uh, that was the Electra. So if you want to look at the, the goofy gun in the Electra's ass that we talked about last podcast, Astro did a great review of that of that book. My yeah. man. The video will be uh, essentially about the new Century miniseries. That's a bit weird. Excellent. Okay, dokie. Look forward to that. And Pac, would you like is to there, a little bit? Oh. Go ahead, Bob. Is there any other context that we need? Is it based on anything... Do you take inspiration from anyone? Like, why should we care? Who, me? Uh, I think he was talking to Astro. So Astro's covering it because it's bad pops, from what I could tell. Yes, yes, it is. It's awful. Oh, well, that's my favorite category is always just people just... LOL. Cal- it's LOL Cal Comics. That's what it is. LOL Cal. Right. That's how you learn. That's how you learn about things. Things exist, and then you realize why they're not so good and why they might be better. And Astro is one of those guys that will actually give you constructive criticism. He's a great man. There's a reason he's on here. Speaking of great men, Mr. Pag, would you like to tell us what you've done or you have the crimes you've committed today? Oh, you. Uh, today, <laughs> um, I, I've gotten about 2,000 words on my most recent novel, which I'm going to be publishing by the end of the month. Um, I'll probably, you know, force through an announcement on King's server because I'm dirty and uh, a leech. Um, so you'll see that if you're in King's server. Um, it's a, kind of a post-apocalyptic uh, magic thing. Um, I love it's it. got a lot to do with mythology and whatnot. So, you know, I think it'll be pretty interesting. Um, and you can always check out the trilogy that I've got out um, if you want to. It's in the chat once again. Little Amazon link right there. That's the series. One, two, three books. It's a trilogy. They're all out. Um, yep. That's just that's, in the chat. It's also it. in the server. So you join the server that's and you need link, you can grab it. And the server. It's actual. All right. And then with that, you all know me. I'm the King of Candor. I would like to thank you all for hanging out with us today. This is a very fun day. And uh, feel free to come and join the server and ask any other questions you have. Look forward to having you all with us. And you all have an excellent day.